Hey there, FBC Youth, Christian here, and welcome back to our second week of online youth services. Um, I'm glad that all of you are back joining us, uh, even in the midst of all the chaos that is going on in our world right now. I am glad you're here. Um, and just in case you missed, like, last week's and just don't know what this is, how this is working, let me give you a little bit of a refresher, okay? Um, so here in a moment, we're going to jump into our announcements, and we're going to have some worship and our lesson. However, because I can't, you know, we're, we're not in person, I can't see you, uh, we're not having small groups. So I want to encourage every single one of you to comment wherever you are watching this, on YouTube, on Facebook, even on Instagram, okay? Uh, make sure that you're leaving some kind of comment so we can engage back and forth in uh, what we're talking about through this series, okay? Um, additionally, something new um, that I'm wanting to do for this week is to have some prayer requests. So if y'all have any prayer requests over this upcoming week, um, again, y'all just comment those below, or let's say you have a prayer request that you would like to keep private, y'all can uh, direct message me on Instagram, on Facebook, uh, or you can just message me through the Remind as well, okay? Um, but next week what I'll do is uh, I'll get on and uh, we'll actually start with our prayer requests for last week, okay? So make sure that you are submitting those for this week, engaging on YouTube, Instagram, all that good stuff in the comment section in whatever way you see fit. Um, but speaking of all this, it brings me actually to our first announcement. Um, so something that we as a church and that I as your youth pastor have been really struggling with and really praying about is when is it going to be safe um, for us to come back and to worship together all in the same physical space? And I'm sure that all of you are having that same question right now as well. Um, and so it is with a heavy heart that I need to convey to you all that uh, we will not be meeting, FBC Youth will not be meeting in person until Lexington ISD announces that they are reopening their doors for the school year. Now, I know that this is indefinite. We don't necessarily know when this is going to happen. Um, it doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. It just means that we don't know when it's going to happen. So make sure that you are remaining in prayer for us about that and for your school. And, um, and I'll make sure to let you all know as soon as I know anything in terms of when we are physically coming back to the yak, okay? Um, so make sure you're watching all the social medias and stuff for that as well. So second announcement I have is that you need to follow FBC Youth on everything internet, okay? So we have a church YouTube channel that is now being utilized, which is where all these videos are being posted. So make sure that you're subscribing to this channel. Um, also, uh, make sure that you are following us on Facebook. You can just look us up uh, FBC Lexington Youth on Facebook, and make sure that you are following us on Instagram as well, at sign FBC Le underscore Lexington underscore Youth, okay? So make sure that you are joining us on all of those as well as getting up to date on our Remind, uh, and you can join that by texting the at sign FBC LEX to the number 81010. So make sure that y'all are getting hooked into all those things uh, so that we can communicate with one another, so that y'all can message me, so that we can talk. Um, so make sure that y'all are connecting with all of those things, okay? Um, I think it's really important for us to stay in touch, especially when we're not in person. Um, so we can just keep in close contact, just find out what's going on in each other's lives and what's happening in the life of our youth group. So make sure you're just staying in tune with all those things, all right, guys? Um, and as I said, make sure that y'all are reaching out to me, messaging me, emailing me if that's better for you, uh, for whatever y'all need, okay? Um, and uh, that brings me actually to our last announcement, uh, is that our money and uh, camp forms are becoming due very, very soon. Uh, April 22nd, I need to have everything from you. Your $50 deposit, your 275 fee for camp on top of the deposit, and all your camp paperwork is due April 22nd, okay? So I need you to get that to me in some way. So whether you're putting it in the mailbox that's outside the doors of the youth, uh, the sorry, the youth activity center, or uh, if you want to just mail it to us uh, at the address that's at the bottom of the screen here, um, y'all can do that as well. But just make sure that you're getting that to us before April 22nd, guys, because that's not us. That's the camp that needs the money, okay? Um, and one other quick note about camp. Um, I just want to ease some of y'all's anxieties about this because I think that uh, we're all kind of in a place in our world we don't necessarily know how things are working and what's going to happen. So um, just in case 
camp doesn't happen. I'm not saying that it's not going to happen. I'm not saying that it's been canceled yet. Okay, so don't don't get worried about that. But I just want to ease your anxieties. If camp does get canceled, if that happens, I want you to know that you will get reimbursed for your money, okay? So don't just wait because you think that camp might not happen. Make sure that you're getting your money in no matter what, and we'll get it back to you just in the worst case scenario if camp doesn't happen, okay? Um, so just make sure that you're getting that money in as soon as possible. Thank you, guys. Um, and that's actually it for our announcements, uh, but I do have a treat for you all today. Um, because we're not able to have our worship together in person, I actually have a special guest who's going to be leading us in worship today. Um, so let me pray for us as we get started, and we'll jump into worship. Dear God, as we all settle into the new realities of our world, we pray that you draw near to us now. God, we have all become so accustomed to being able to just run over to the yak on Wednesdays to see all our friends and our mentors, and to gather in a community that worships and follows you. And as we cope with that being ripped out from under us now, God, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather even in our homes and to hear your word now. And to see that not even a mandated quarantine can stop your amazing work, God. So we pray that in this time, you allow us to forget that we're staring at screens, join together and raise our voices in worship from within our homes, and to know that your Holy Spirit is among us even now. So Lord, we love you. We thank you that you loved us first. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Now let us join together in worship. Good morning, church. It is good to gather again in this new paradigm. I would love for us all just to take a moment to recognize that this is strange, that it might be a touch uncomfortable and it is peculiar, and that's okay. In First Peter, the scriptures call us to be a peculiar people. We were designed for this. We were designed to worship. No matter where we are, we are unified and we join into the heavens. And we should recognize that nothing about worship has ever been normal anyway. When we gather in a room and we lift our hands together and we sing songs to a God that we can't visibly see, it is strange and we should treat it as such. So as we are gathered together now, unified, let's be strange. Let us be the peculiar people we were called to be. Let us worship freely make a joyful noise together. You guys are ready? Let's do this. Sing heaven thunder. Heaven thunder. And the world was born. Life begins and ends in the dust you fall. Faith commanded and the mountains move. Fear is losing ground to our hope in you. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Freedom conquered, all our chains undone. Sin defeated, Jesus is overcome. Mercy trial, when the third day dawned. Darkness was denied when the storm was gone. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. 
Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Nothing shall be impossible. Can Christ grow his church even when the church cannot gather together? Yes, he can. Can he grow your faith even when you cannot gather together with the body? Yes, he can. Let's sing it out. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. No. Unstoppable God, come on, church, lift it up. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on in all. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on in all. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Before the throne of God, before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart I know that while in heaven he stands No tongue can bid me thence depart No tongue can bid me thence depart When Satan tempts me to despair And tells me of the guilt within Upward I look and see him there Who made an end to all my sin Because the sinless Savior died My sinful soul is counted free God the just is satisfied To look on him and pardon me To look on him and pardon me Holding there, behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the king of glory and of grace. One with himself, I cannot die. 
My soul is purchased by His blood My life is hid with Christ on high With Christ my Savior and my God With Christ my Savior and my God One with Himself I cannot die My soul is purchased by His blood My life is hid with Christ on high With Christ my Savior and my God With Christ my Savior and my God Your name 
Come on, church, be bold. Let's sing it out together. Your name, your name is higher. Your name is greater. Oh, my hope is in you. Your word unfailing. Your promise unshaken. Oh, my hope. on nothing less My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest friend but wholly lean on Jesus' name Sing that again. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteous name. I dare not trust the sweetest faith, but only lean on Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone. Cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all.
shall come with trumpet sound When he shall come with trumpet sound Oh may I then in him be found Dressed in his righteousness alone Fathers to stand before the throne Christ alone Cornerstone Weak made strong In the Savior's love Through the storm Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. What's the hardest thing you have ever done? Maybe it's the long list of chores that your parents gave you, or that one school project that you stayed up all night working on. Or maybe it's just a hard conversation that you had with a loved one. We all have to do things that are hard, guys. And a few years ago, there was this TV show called Dirty Jobs. Some of you might remember it. Um, but every week, the host would go to a different job that nobody wanted to do, and he would show you how hard that job was. So let's watch a quick clip from an episode where the host was a horse poop tester. Let's take a look. The poo has to be sifted before it goes to the lab. So all these little balls have to be broken down because this is 24 hours worth of poo. This is a full 24 hour cycle? Yes. For Ralph, that's 60 pounds of poo. He's a pooping machine. Ralph is a monster. We have a tin, so this is gonna go in the pan. Analyze. It's like a little Italian restaurant to go, I think. Yeah. We pretty much just want it to be kind of level with the top, and then you'll kind of, you're gonna want to kind of press it down so that it's flat. Yeah, you can kind of, yeah, just kind of press it in there, get it pressed to the corners. Yeah. Uh huh. I feel as though mine is filled. I think you're right. And then we take them into the feed room and we weigh them. All right. All right, and then we put them in the freezer. All right, so we're gonna weigh the poop. Now, hopefully none of you ever have to do that, but there are things that we have to do in our lives that are hard. And in this series, we're looking at some of the hardest things that Jesus ever did. And hopefully most of you know by now that we're in this series called The End of the Beginning, where we're looking around the actual events that happened to Jesus during his last week here on earth. And rather than looking at the scripture that applies to the truth of Jesus, the lessons that Jesus taught us, and applying those truths to our lives, during this series we're looking more at the big, true reality of what happened to Jesus during his life in this last week. Looking more at the history side of things, the informational, educational side of things. Um, and, you know, I think that even though we're not getting that truth of Jesus, we're still getting a lot of very valuable information that deepens our knowledge of who Christ is, and we can draw closer to him in this process. So as we jump into our lesson for this week, let's review real quick. What did we talk about the first week of this series, the week before spring break? Do you remember what happened to Jesus as he entered the city of Jerusalem? There were two things that happened that first day. Do you all remember? The first is that Jesus had this triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. He fulfills the Old Testament prophecy by riding into the city on a donkey. And all these people immediately realize that Jesus is the Messiah. He is that king to come that Israel has been waiting for for generations. Even though he doesn't necessarily look like a king. And so after Jesus enters the city, he goes to the temple and he purifies it. He 
casts out all those people who are selling stuff in his house. And the Jewish leaders really don't like him as a result. They see him taking away their power, and they look at him and see, this guy's not a real king. He's dressed in rags. He's not ready to take up a sword against the Romans and fight. So they decide to kill him. So that's what happens on Sunday, the first week that we talked about this. What happens the following Thursday? This is what we talked about last week. What happened? We talked about the Last Supper, this last meal that Jesus has with his disciples while he's here on earth. Um, and he explains to them during this meal that he was going to die. And we see that all the disciples become really confused by this information. Um, and they realize that it's one of them that is going to betray Jesus. And we talked about how it could have been any one of them that could have handed him over to the Jewish authorities. So this week, we're going to be looking at what happens later that night, in the midnight hours of Thursday night, likely moving into the early hours of Friday morning. Now, after that Last Supper, Jesus knew that his time was nearly up. And as Jesus was walking with his disciples after their meal, Jesus starts to pray. And he prays with his disciples, allowing them to hear. And I think that this prayer is extremely invaluable because it really is the last time that he prays with his disciples. So let's take a look at this prayer that Jesus prays in John 17. And this prayer has three main sections we're going to look at. And the first is that Jesus is praying for himself. So let's look at this in John 17, verses 1 through 2. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes into heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him the authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. This isn't strange. Because obviously, this is about to be an incredibly intense trial for Jesus. He's worried. Jesus is basically praying, God, make sure that this thing that I'm about to do that's going to be really hard actually sticks. Make sure it works, God. And I think that this is something that we forget sometimes. That going to the cross wasn't just physically hard for Jesus. It wasn't about the torture. It wasn't about the nails and the hands even. It was emotionally difficult. Jesus, even though he was God in the flesh, was human. He was afraid. He was anxious. He was scared. And he was tempted not to go through with this. To run, just like Jonah, and to not look back. But he knows that he must live in accordance of the will of God. And he is praying that God will follow through with this plan. That God will assist him in this, to help him as he walks this difficult path. Guys, even Jesus wasn't above being afraid of not knowing exactly how things are going to play out. Afraid of the pain and the critical eyes that were going to be looking upon him. But I think that we need to pay attention to Jesus' response. He doesn't turn anywhere but to God. So let me ask you, where do you turn when things are difficult? Is it God or is it something else? Maybe it's a lot of things. And what do you think you could do to more easily have a response like Jesus did and turn to your Father in Heaven when things get hard? No one was above temptation. Not even Jesus, guys. But one of the things that helps show us where we should put our trust is our reaction when things in our life do get hard. Do we turn to God or do we turn somewhere else? And we should always seek out God when we're in those situations, whether it be through prayer, reading your Bible, or just talking to a godly mentor. 
Absolutely, we should seek out that comfort in our family, in our friends, but we need to recognize that God is the one that is working through them because that's what Jesus did. Next, we see Jesus pray for his disciples. So let's read together in John 17, verses 14 through 18. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you would take them out of this world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Jesus knows that things are about to get really, really difficult for his disciples when he leaves. Things are going to get really dark. Remember our big story that's happening in the background of Jerusalem. The Jewish leaders are gunning to kill Jesus as the first chance they get when this Passover festival is over. And as soon as Jesus is dead, who do you think they're going to turn to next to attack? It's going to be the disciples. It's going to be Jesus' closest followers, the ones, that's, the ones that know the most about Jesus and who he is. And just like we discussed last week, the disciples were a broken people, just like you and me. None of them were above um, this temptation to go out and to call out Jesus to the Jewish leaders. None of them were above that. Any one of them could have betrayed Jesus. And Jesus was mostly afraid, and I think something that prompts this prayer is of them forgetting about him of no longer believing in the truth, the story that he showed them in his life. Or maybe even just the fear of them straight up denouncing Jesus after he becomes public enemy number one. The world had already hated him, and they were about to turn their attention to his followers once he was dead. And so Jesus prays for his disciples that they would be steadfast in their faith, and continue to turn towards God, even when things looked the darkest. So, Jesus prays for his disciples that they would be protected, that God would help them in their cause, as they take this message to God's people. And so, third, we see Jesus pray for the future believers. So let's read this together in John 17, 20-21. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Hear this, guys. Right before Jesus was arrested, unjustly tried and killed. Jesus prays for those who are about to arrest him and kill him. He prayed that even after all that was about to happen, all these people who were saying that he wasn't the Messiah, that he wasn't the Son of God, that he wasn't dying for them, that they would come to know him as Jesus, as God in the flesh. But not only that, he praise for those who had heard his word, that had started following him, that they would continue to faithfully follow him. And lastly, in this prayer, Jesus is praying for you. He is praying for all future believers who will follow him in his name, that you and all future people will come to know him. But why would Jesus pray this? He knew that belief would be difficult. And that following would be even harder. So he prays that the future believers would be unified and lean on their God during trials. Does it surprise you that as Jesus is headed to the cross to endure more suffering than either you or I could ever imagine, that he prays for you? 
How could this new way of thinking of prayer help your own prayer life? I think that a majority of us, when we're in the midst of trials and troubles, that we pray for ourselves in that situation. Absolutely. I think that Jesus shows his wisdom here, though, in showing how important it can be to focus our prayer off of ourselves and more pouring into the lives of those around us. Those that need God near to them. Those that need to hear Jesus' name for the first time. For God to ask us to be part of this journey of other people as others are brought to him is a blessing, guys. It's an opportunity for us to do this even when our lives are difficult. To continue to think and to pray for others. So after Jesus prays this prayer, they arrive at the Mount of Olives. And Jesus is still very anxious about this situation, and that anxiety is only rising. Don't get me wrong, Jesus is sure about what he needs to do. He knows that this is going to happen, that this needs to happen. But, as we've already said, Jesus is very, very human. He doesn't know what death feels like, just like you and me, and he's afraid. He doesn't know what this pain that he's about to endure is going to feel like, but he knows that it's going to be more pain than he could ever imagine. More pain than you or I could ever experience. He was about to see his own people, his Jewish nation that God had led out and protected from Egypt for thousands of years. These people were about to spit upon him, to mock him, to laugh at him, to condemn him to death, to not even believe that he is the Messiah, the king that has come to save them as they put him on a cross. Jesus is human, just like you and me. This was stressful, guys. So even though he just prayed with his disciples, he's not done. Jesus is worried, and so he continues to pray and to find that peace in the arms of the Father. But this time, Jesus wants to be alone to pray. He needs his own space. So he asks most of his disciples to wait at the gate of the garden that they're at. And he asks Peter, James, and John to follow him into the garden a little bit further so that they can be near to him. And now we see Jesus pray in the garden alone. In Luke 22, 39 through 46. And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about one stone's throw, and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. But get this, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray, that you may not enter into temptation. Remember guys, this is like three or four in the morning. It's late. These guys have been up all night, staying with their friend in his time of need. We see Peter, James, and John, though, they're all dozing off. They're tired. It's been a long day. We see that Jesus wakes them up as he continues to pray. Because even though the disciples are dozing off, Jesus certainly is not. This is a high-anxiety, high-pressure moment for Jesus. And we see how much stress he is under here. As Jesus experiences this really rare medical anomaly where in situations where you are in extreme stress, like a lot of stress, your capillaries, your blood vessels will actually burst open under that stress. And it will mix with your sweat and you will actually sweat blood. 
This is what we believe is happening to Jesus right here. That is the kind of stress that he is under, guys. He is in agony. But still, we see that he knows what he has to do. Dying that painful death is the least of his concerns. He isn't a coward who's afraid of pain. He is a blameless person who is fearful of the righteous wrath of God. The entire weight, the punishment of the sin of all people is about to be put upon him all at once. The punishment of God is so much more than just that cross. It's more than just the nails in his hands. It's more than the crown of thorns across his head. It's an unthinkable, unknowable punishment for every single one of us. He literally had the weight of the entire world on his shoulders. Guys, do you ever feel like you're under intense pressure? When you're in those situations, where does your mind turn? What thoughts cross your head? And if you pray, what is it that you pray in those situations? I think that Jesus' response should truly inform how we should respond under intense pressure. Jesus prays, take this cup from me. Essentially saying, God, if there is any other way for this salvation thing to be accomplished, for these people to be saved, reveal it to me right now, God. I need that other way. I am human, and if I can avoid death, God, you bet I'm going to do it. If there is any other way that we can accomplish this, God, without me dying, God, please let it be so. Snap to it. Get on it, God. But then Jesus demonstrates his true resolve. And he shows us what it truly means to have faith in God. Because even when the hardest thing of Jesus' life is on the horizon, Jesus resigns to God's plans and recognizes that God's plans are greater than his own. He says, not my will, but your will be done, God. It can be hard, especially when we are under intense pressure, guys, to think rationally, to think about God, to turn to our Father in heaven and say, God, I give this all up to you because I know that you love me and I know that your plans are greater than mine. Have you ever struggled to give something up to God? What are some things that you could start doing right now to start working to give up to God. For some, it might be our fear of financial security or your anxieties about what the future holds for you or the strong desire to be in a romantic relationship or whether or not to lie about the thing that you did or the addiction that you're hopelessly stuck in. Understand that we all struggle to give things up to God sometimes, guys. And we see right here in this passage that our Lord and Savior even struggled with it too. Going to the cross was the hardest thing that Jesus ever did. The greatest sacrifice that our God has ever made. And he did it for you. So even in our fear, our anxiety, even in our uneasiness of God's plan and what's coming next, We should always seek to turn to our God and to ask for his will to be done in our lives. Let us pray together. God, we thank you for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus, of the incredibly difficult, stressful, emotional roller coaster that you sent him on so that we may be reunited with you. We look to Jesus' struggle in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we see that it is part of our humanity. To encounter such emotions like these, God, it is part of us. But God, we pray that as we continually encounter the hard stuff of life, that you don't let our fears and anxieties rule us. That you allow us to turn and rest 
in you always. God, give us the strength to give up our own plans and our own will in favor of yours. Plans that are for your good, for our good, for your people's good. That will ultimately result in a forgiven future that can only be found in you. God, we love you. We thank you that you loved us first. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, guys, thank you for joining us for our youth service this week. And don't forget to follow us on all things internet. Stay up to date with what's happening in our youth ministry. And as always, as we approach this week, may we love God, may we embrace his beauty, and may we live life to the fullest. See you all next time.